we had the enumeration of propositional variables then we introduced one special set of cnfs we call it am which is the set of cnfs or rather clusters am itself is a cnf so it the set of all clusters uh, which use so it is really possible use they may not use every one of them but they do not use anything beyond these things right so his use of propositional variables from the first m variables okay then we introduced the resolution closure of a given cnf a r star a okay this is the resolvent closure or resolution closure of the cnf a so let's write it resolvent closure of cnf a then we came across two results so first result was if r star a intersection am is satisfiable then so is r star a intersection am plus 1 the next result was in better connection with what we are going to prove okay but there we say that if bottom does not belong to r star a intersection am then it is satisfiable so for each am greater than or equal to 1 if bottom does not belong to r star a intersection am then this set r star a intersection am is satisfiable these two results we had proved okay now you are going to the proper results what we wanted so let's write it as a theorem So let's write one again. We know bottom does not belong to R star A intersection A M. Now we should show that bottom does not belong to R star A itself. Okay? Then R star A will be satisfiable. But our main interest is in A, not in R star A. So we'll rather write A is satisfiable. Okay? And also conversely, that is the next result. So all that we need is. A is a CNF. Let A be a CNF, and R star A. Uh, its resolvent closure. So we say that uh, bottom does not belong to R star A, if and only. A is satisfiable. Okay. So proof should be easier now. So this result is called closure property of resolution. In some sense, it is closed. That means once bottom is there, you know something. If bottom is not there, you also know something. So that way everything is done. That's why it is called closure property of resolution.
in some sense this is also the soundness and completeness of resolution, but we will come to see it in a minute. So, for proof what we start let us say bottom belongs to R star A. So, can you say that A is unsatisfiable? This is what we should have right? if the statement is correct. If button belongs to this then A should be unsatisfiable that is one part. If bottom does not belong to R star A then it is satisfiable that is the other part. Okay? So, we are taking the contribution not proving it directly. So, suppose bottom belongs to R star A then what happens R star A is unsatisfiable that is clear, but how to say A is unsatisfiable? Well, suppose from A in one step you have got bottom, can you say A is unsatisfiable? Why? Uh, because once bottom has been obtained in one step, A entails bottom, right? Suppose it has been obtained in two steps, then also A entails bottom, therefore A is unsatisfiable. So, it is induction, is it clear? it is induction and the principle of resolution which says that if A uh, or some W has been obtained from A by resolution then A entails W. Okay? So, bottom has been obtained from A that is what it means when you say bottom belongs to R star A in some finite number of steps. So, you need induction there fine we will not give the details here we can just give a comment that by the principle of resolution. and induction it follows that A entails bottom is it clear therefore A is unsatisfiable. So, this is really the soundness of resolution if something has been obtained it is really entailed by those that is the soundness. So, now we are going to be the completeness. So, conversely suppose bottom does not belong to R star A. Now, you should tell me looking at the two results lemma 1 and lemma 2 that is what we want to prove. What we have proved is if R star A intersection A M or if bottom does not belong to that then that is satisfiable. So, it should be clear now because A itself So, R star A intersection A M is satisfiable why A, why A? So, we so want A. is equal to the number of uh, propositional variables in A. Ah, that we have to tell. See A is a CNF, so A uses some propositional variables. There is a finite number of propositional variables A uses. Okay. So, once A uses only finite number of propositional variables, then you can say all the propositional variables belong to some set P 0 to P m or P m minus 1 is that okay? say up to P 100 you are using. So, you take the set P 0 to P 100 if only P 1000 is there okay, you take P 0 to P 1000 is that clear. So, there from we will start. So, suppose or rather we can give a reason instead of assuming since A has only occurrences of a finite number of propositional variables
there exists an m which is greater than or equal to 1 such that all the propositional variables used or occurring in A are from P 0 to P m minus 1. Okay. Then R star A becomes equal to R star A intersection A m. Okay, because there is no other propositional variable. Up to AM, you have all the clauses. So all the clauses in R star A are in AM also, right? So those two sets become equal. Once it happens, now bottom does not belong to R star A intersection AM, right? So by lemma two. R star A intersection A M is satisfiable. Okay. Is that right? But A is a subset of this. Therefore, A is satisfiable. Directly you can see there is one interpretation which satisfies every clause in R star A intersection A m, A is a subset of that. So, the same I satisfies every clause in A, this is really monotonicity. Okay. So, by monotonicity, A is satisfied. that ends the proof of closure property. So, once you have this you can see adequacy of resolution soundness and completeness in fact this is, but we have to formulate in another way. So, let us write it. Let sigma be a finite set of propositions W a proposition, then what we want is sigma entails W if and only if sigma entails W has a resolution proof. Okay. So, it says that entailment is completely captured by resolution that is what we wanted fine. Now, proof should be easy yes can you see the proof. Hmm? Yeah. You have to use the definition of a resolution proof. So, resolution proof of sigma entails W starts with a CNF representation of sigma along with not W. Okay. So, you have to bring from that fine. So, let us try say sigma entails W and now you know that sigma is a finite set. So, if sigma is a finite set you can write sigma equal to say W 1 to W n for some n. Okay. So, let us start with that. it is finite. Now, you may say sigma entails W if and only if W 1 and W 2 
and W n. Well, you can take implies or you may say and not W okay. is unsatisfiable. So, we are using redux word absurdum directly here. Then this happens if and only if you take the CNF representation. So, you may write CNF of W1 and CNF of WN and CNF of not W is unsatisfiable. Then what next? See, you can take the whole thing as A itself. It is a CNF and CNF and CNF and so on. So, it is a set of clauses. So, that itself is your A now. Right? Now, apply the resolution principle or resolution closure property of resolution, which says A B is CNF. Then you say bottom does not belong to Astra if and only if A is satisfiable. So, this says if this is your A, then this is unsatisfiable if and only if bottom belongs to R star of that, right. So, that says if and only if bottom belongs to R star of Fine. This is by the theorem one. Closure property of resolution. And this is exactly your definition for resolution proof. Right? If bottom belongs to that, if bottom can be derived from this, then you say that that is a proof of a sigma entails W. So this says sigma entails W as a resolution proof. Fine. So, there is guarantee now, we are happy huh? that our single rule which is called the RPL is enough, if the CNF is or the set of CNFs is satisfiable then we will never get bottom and we can show that we will never get. How to check that you will never get because R star A becomes finite somewhere it will terminate right at a stage. So, there is an algorithm to do it, but the algorithm is very inefficient. You have to go on generating all the classes and it is very crude also. So, that can be serpent right. So, serpent means somewhere some waste is being happening in inside the algorithm those wastes have to be thrown away that is how it will become efficient right. So, what are the wastes you have to find out where our lever goes last, we are not getting anything out of our lever that we have to find out, while we are generating this R star A, fine. So, one possible thing is suppose you have already got bottom, suppose you have started with one A, in R 1 itself you have got bottom, but you know it is not R star A, if you go to R 2 A, it is having some more clauses than R 1 A, but is there any need to go to R 2 A, there is no need we stop there because we wanted whether bottom belongs to that or not, bottom belongs to. So, even if you go further you will get bottom belongs to that fine. So, that is our first observation, some simple observations like that will make it efficient. So, let us see. So, first observation is this that if bottom is generated in uh, say R m a stop there, some simple rule. Huh? So, you do not have to go for R star A now, this is easy. Huh? Second one is suppose you have obtained 
one uh, clause which is tautological, which is valid. That is, it is in the form P or not P, or something else may be there, right? It is a clause. It is a disjunctive clause, and it becomes valid when, for some literal P, you have both P and not P occurring in it. So suppose P is there, not P is there. Some others may be there, may not be there. Doesn't matter. Now it is tautological. So once it is tautological, it means in the CNF you add that clause with any other clause, you will get the other clause only. Hmm? Do you see what I am telling? See in the CNF A, suppose you have some clause here C and there is another clause, so let us write set form, there is another which is P or not P, some others may be there. When? Now what happens? It means I have C and P or not P. Okay. So, when you take and with top, it gives only that. So, this will be equivalent to C itself. Right? So, it is not only for P or not P or even something else is that does not matter. It will be all together. Right? So, top or anything else is also top. Fine? It will be reduced to this. So, that means, whenever you get such a class where there is a literal and its negation, you can safely delete it. Okay. So, that is one of the waste that we have to cut all. Fine. So, that is our observation true. Such clauses are called tautological clauses, trivial clauses or non-fundamental clauses. There are so many names. So, we call a clause to be fundamental if it does not have a pair of complementary literals. Right. So, let us write it, a clause is called fundamental if it does not contain a pair of complementary laterals. So, our observation 2 is delete all non fundamental clauses. Okay. Then the updated class is equivalent to the original class, right? Not the class, the CNF, right. So, the updated CNF is equivalent to the original. That is why you can delete it. Fine. So, two types of wastes we have gone done away with. There is another kind of waste. Let us see what. Suppose in A, I have say P, I also have P or Q. I have something else, right? We take resolution, okay? Suppose R or not P is there. Now you are going to take resolution. So with P, if I take resolution, I get R. With P or Q, if I take I get Q or R. So, R will be there, Q or R will be there. Now, you see these types of things will go on repeating. Okay. You will get one R again on Q or R, you will get something some class C and then you will get C or Q. Right? It will proceed, but you see from the beginning that the whole CNF is equivalent to P, R or not P. Right? Why is it so? Because it is undead together. This is equivalent to P itself by the law of absorption. Right? It is something like A intersection with A union B. So, you get A only, the same way it is going. Fine. 
So, there is no need to keep this P or Q and then get all these wasteful resolutions. Is it clear? So, that is our third observation. You would say, but how to formally define it? So, our strategy is uh, keep only a subset, a class now, and delete all its supersets. That is what it says. Right? All supersets will be deleted. P is a set now, singleton P. Then P or Q is taken as P comma Q set. So, if you take P, then you have to delete P or Q. P Q set will be deleted. Fine. So, you can write that or you may say that a clause we give a definition just like for observation 2. A clause C subsumes a clause D if C is a subset of D, which means D is equal to C or some x. Okay. If you write in R form, it will look like this. If you write in set form, it will look like this. C is a subset of D. Then you say that C subsumes D. Okay. So here our strategy is, if a class C subsumes a class D, then delete D. So delete all those classes which are subsumed by others. That's what it says. Okay. So delete. All those clauses which are subsumed by others. So, here also equivalence is preserved, right, because of that P and P or Q is equivalent to P. So, you say that the updated CNF of dated no? updated CNF is equivalent to the original. In fact, this strategy is very helpful in getting something else. Uh, those from electrical engineering can understand this better. They must have done Carnap maps and other types of things, right? So those kind of algorithms cannot be generalized to more than four variables. Carnap map, for example, it will be very difficult once you go for more than four variables. Okay? But but something can be done even if there are more than four variables, where this subsumption helps. Hmm? So what is done is that you define a uh, prime implicate you define the prime implicate by taking if C is a clause okay, you have a class C and then you have uh, okay, a CNF let us take a CNF directly hmm. say so, A is the CNF and C is a clause Okay. You say that C is a prime implicate or let us say implicate first, we define in two stages. Huh? C is an implicate of A if A enters C. Okay. Then you say a class D is a prime implicate if D is an implicate, D is an implicate and what happens? And you are telling that it is prime, it is not subsumed by any other implicates. That is what you want to say. Huh? So, what turns out to be that D is, an, D is a prime implicate if there is no other implicate in between them. Right? 
if there is not another implicate which entails it right if no other implicate entails it that means between a and d you will never get another thing through this entailment relation then you say it is prime so which turns out to be that coming to the subsumption because there are clauses one clause entails another clause means one will be a subset of the other that's why subsumption comes in okay so this set of prime implicates of a cnf can be computed by taking the residue of subsumptions apply the subsumption tests delete all those things whatever remains that is the set of prime implicates okay because all those which can subsume they have been kept those which are subsumed they are thrown away so all the non prime implicates have been thrown away whatever remains is the only prime implicates and that is equivalent to the original cnf okay so that is what followed usually more than four variables you use the set of prime implicates instead of going for the carnap maps okay this residue of subsumption idea can be used in the resolution itself because we do not want this unnecessary waste okay we have to throw away all those clauses which are subsumed so try to go back to the algorithm what we have done for computing r star a there you can modify and incorporate resumption uh, the subsumption method so what we had done is start with a call that a0 then you take a1 as uh, resolution r of a then a2 as r of a1 and proceed right and you stop when a n plus 1 is equal to a n itself there you are stopping okay so this means a n plus 1 which is equal to r of a n which is found to be equal to an then you stop there that is your r star fine now you want to employ subsumption method so that means every stage you throw away the subsumed clauses go on doing that fine so here itself you can start with the subsumption okay so call it say b0 which is equal to rs of a so rs we are writing for residue of subsumption means throw away the subsumed clauses whatever remains is the residue right so that is residue of subsumption fine suppose i start a with the earlier example let us take say p p r q now a0 is p p r q but when i come to b0 i see that p r q is subsumed so i delete p r q what remains is p alone that is rs of a0 right residue of subsumption then while you come to a1 equal to r1 of a again you write b1 equal to residue of subsumption of a1 okay but then when you take r of a0 here instead of a0 you start with b0 now right by taking a0 you achieve nothing again some more unnecessary waste is there so don't go to a0 go back to b0 rather you are losing nothing only residue of subsumption we are getting at every step similarly after getting residue of a1 instead of going to resolution on a1 we go to resolution on b1 fine and it continues that way so again you take b2 equal to residue of subsumption on a2 it continues that way so when you come to the last one an plus 1 you would write r of bn that should be equal to an itself right or you may say it is bn bn is enough because from an you have thrown out many things so you may not get them back so let's write that should be equal to bn so when an plus 1 becomes equal to bn you stop there right 
So, that B n will be called as it is not exactly R star, because many things have been gone, they have been deleted unnecessary things. So, let us write that R s star of A. Okay. So, subsumption is also used that is what it says R s star of A. So, incidentally this R s star of A will be the set of prime implicates. Right? Everything is thrown away. So, what remains is that only. Fine. So, here again you can put that heuristic of looking at the bottom your observation 1. If anywhere bottom is generated stop there instead of going for the R s star that is always monitored. So, that resolution becomes a bit efficient, fine, but still everything is not over yeah. Yeah, that will be the cost. You have to check only resum, uh, subsumption always, every step. That is not big because anyway the problem is in NP, and this will cost only some linearity there, some linear test, right? Maximum n square. Check for this. One. It's n log n can be done, but okay. Every step doesn't matter now. Okay. Now, let us see some more observations which will help us. Suppose you take a CNF where in some of its clutches a literal P occurs. Try to imagine this in some of its clutches the literal P occurs, but in none of the clutches not P occurs. Right? Such a thing is called a pure literal. Now, when I want to see that whether the set is satisfiable or not, what will I do first? I will put that p equal to 1, right? I want to find a model for it. So, I will simply take p equal to 1, it does not matter now, and 1 or anything else will become 1, right? That is why I am taking 1 instead of 0. If I take 0, then I have to delete that small p from everywhere wherever it occurs, but if I take that p to be 1 then all those clauses wherever it occurs they become true automatically. So, I can do away with all those clauses that is still simpler right and now if the remaining thing is also satisfiable then original will be satisfiable right and conversely if the original is satisfiable even if you give 0 or 1 does not matter now this is satisfiable. So, you can always extend it to go back right. So, both the ways it can be done. So, here but check that it is not equivalence preserving. If the updated one is a prime original was a, a is not equivalent to a prime, but satisfiability is preserved right. So, this is what will be going as our next observation they are called the pure literals. So, our observation 4 is delete all those clauses containing the pure literal so this the is ambiguous huh? this the is ambiguous here first you have to find out what is a pure literal there then go for it okay it is context dependent here then uh, the updated class updated class updated CNF rather is preserving satisfiability right is satisfiable if and only if the original one is satisfiable. Okay. To see how does it operate, just see in the abstract at least, it looks something like this. See, I have not P or Q, R or S, S or not P. Okay. This is my A. Now, I find that not P is a pure literal. 
no here p is occurring only not p is occurring fine so i identify not p is a pure lateral then what i do from this a i construct another set a prime where i delete all those clauses which are having the occurrence of pure lateral that's all this really simplifies a lot okay so now a is satisfiable if and only a prime is satisfiable from this to this you know you just give one and then you do it from this also you extend the same way suppose it is satisfiable i of r i of s is given now you add to that i of not p equal to 1 i of p is 0 so there is an extension which is a model of it okay clear so this is sometimes called the pure lateral heuristics it's a heuristic we are applying it's called pure lateral heuristic so the other one concerns the unit clauses so unit clause is a clause having a single lateral like p not q and so on a single clause uh, a clause is composed of that single lateral then you call that clause as a unit clause okay suppose there is a unit clause then what happens Hmm. Let us take an example. Here P is a unit class. Okay, it is not pure. Right, it is not pure lateral because not P is occurring. But then there is a heuristic here also. What do you do? First, delete that unit class. Okay, there is no need to keep it. Next, what do you do? Wherever you see not P. delete all those not p is not the clauses delete not p occurrences of not p so delete this that's all you will be getting so that is for subsumptions oh, okay that is different okay so i am only explaining unit class not for the subsumption if you apply subsumption still it becomes more efficient huh okay so what happens here is it equivalent to this it's not equivalent satisfiability is preserved right basically what you are doing is you have p you have not p or s you take resolution you get s right so that's what the deletion of not p says but then p you are removing because after this not p will never be coming there so p becomes on pure lateral you can delete p right so both the things are used simultaneously now so that is called the unit class heuristics so what you do there is uh for delete all unit classes and then if the unit class is p delete all not p all occurrences of not p rather and other clauses now it says that the uh, resulting cnf is satisfiable if and only if the original is original Hmm? Because we are deleting P also. No? Yes. So the original will entail. Entail it. This P and something else. But this one we don't know how to go back because P is there, right? It may not entail. 
because I can give another interpretation P make 0, so it will not enter. Okay. So, this is another heuristic. In fact, there is an algorithm which uses these two heuristics instead of going for resolution. Only pure literal, literal heuristics and the unit clauses heuristics, only those two. But then these two are not complete, it will not succeed always. So, you need something more. So, what they do is you take arbitrarily another literal there, just choose one of the literals in the remaining one, when you are not able to use these two heuristics then give that value 1. In fact, we are doing something like a truth table, give that value 1, then try to see. So, once you give 1, you have lot of simplifications, 1 or something will become 1 and so on, then delete all those things, it is equivalent to deleting all those things. Then after that, what you do? Just use again those two heuristics, right, continue. If you find bottom, then it original is unsatisfiable if you do not then go back right go back give that again zero and start so in the worst case it can become exponential that's fine everything in the worst case is exponential here so that is one of the other procedures so that is called dpll procedure In fact, this Davis Putnam procedure was written first for the first order logic, not for the propositional logic, which we will do later. And then, later, these two uh, people, Longman and Loveland, they again included and that became the DPLL algorithm uh, for propositional logic. That does not use resolution, but if you use these two heuristics along with resolution, it is really efficient. Most of the cases are solved very easily. Post case is exponential <laughs> and whether it can be done or not we do not know, we have done it exponentially that is all it says. It does not say worst case will be exponential, no. In these algorithms there is another result which says that whatever variant of resolution you are using does not matter, there is always a formula where it will be giving exponential result, it is a very strong result. Hmm? essentially to the table evaluation, but then we are interested in most of the cases solving many cases which are coming from practice they can be solved. 